So this is probably the most requested video I've ever had in my social media career. So I figured, hey, let's make this the first YouTube video, actual YouTube video that I post on this channel. So the professional potster of the scientific community, Terrence Howard, just went on Joe Rogan. And we got a lot to unpack in that little episode. So Terrence is trying to do many things including revolutionize nearly every industry on the planet, but what he's primarily trying to do is unify all fields of study, which has pretty much been the goal of every scientist in existence. So can he do it? I don't know. But he did talk about some stuff that I feel like I'm pretty uniquely qualified to talk about, so I want to talk about that stuff today. Now, if you follow me on my short form platforms, you know I've touched on a few things that he's talked about. But I would like to take this opportunity to go a little bit deeper, especially on the flower of life, sacred geometry stuff, because I just wrote a book about it and I will be referencing that. So if you want to check that out, I will link that here. And also, Joe, if you want to go real deep on this, I'm your neighbor. I'm literally right up the street. Hit me up. Let's let's do some talking, dude. So with that said, let's explore some of the things that Terrence has brought up. In the Terrence interview on Joe Rogan, Terrence cites Tesla, Walter Russell, John Keeley, Dale Pond, and Rupert Sheldrake. I'm not going to explain Tesla's contributions because by now, if you don't know the hundreds of things that he did to advance humanity, then you should probably pause this video and go watch another video on what Tesla has done. Walter Russell was an accomplished painter, sculptor, co-op community developer, motivational speaker, and he worked in IBM for 12 years. He died in 1963, so he's not that far back. His book, The Universal One, is quickly becoming popular again because his theories actually make sense and they unify a lot of the gaps and the confusing parts of actual science and physics that you would learn traditionally in like a university. Most notably, the periodic wave of elements that I've referenced about 10 times in my short form videos, but we will be diving deeper into that today. John Whirl Keeley is a rabbit hole of rabbit holes. His work is absolutely insane. It's similar to Tesla's work with scalar waves, but in a different context. If you want the mainstream accounts of Keeley's life, then check out his Wikipedia page. It sounds a little biased, but they do cite a lot of sources. Keeley was an inventor in the late 1800s and claimed he could produce a motor using etheric force and resonance. After many years of back and forth with shareholders at his company, his inventions were ultimately deemed as a failure since he could not accurately demonstrate them working. He was issued a challenge by the scientific community to prove his theories, which he ignored. Even Tesla and Edison were called upon to review the science and theories behind his inventions. Both of them declined. One of the engines he built went up for sale in the 80s and was purchased by the next fella, Dale Pond. Now, I came across Dale Pond whilst driving back to Texas from Kansas. A YouTube video was on my recommended page. I will link it. I will link it down there. And... I watched it three times and I still watch it about like once a year, I'm not even kidding. Del Pond got a hold of one of these Keeley motors and tried to reverse engineer it even claiming he put it in a bathtub of water and it started to work. There was nothing in the bathtub, it was just full of water and it started to work. Not to the extent that Keeley said, but you can just watch the video and he'll explain that. Dale concluded that the engine ran off a combination of techniques that harness scalar waves, that same stuff that Tesla was talking about. One being the water hammer effect in plumbing, which I had never heard of being a useful thing. Ultimately, what I got from the video was that Keeley held back from releasing the technology because he may have thought that in the wrong hands, it could be horrifically destructive. And this was before nukes, this was before the atomic age all of this stuff so maybe he was onto something i don't know i try and stay unbiased even though i want to believe in all the conspiracy stuff i still have to keep a foot in reality because we all do because we're here valid thought my assumption is that the engine was somehow tuned to keely's unique frequency and that could be his body as a whole it could be a conscious frequency maybe he could you know convey that we can read brainwaves 
sending out signals with the funny hats so it's not out of the realm of possibility that somehow maybe he figured that out i don't know that's my assumption i lean more on this side because I, I lean more on the side of he knew something and held it back because keely was not a stupid dude he he got he had enough resources and he had enough theory behind his work to secure substantial investment Second, there's a ton of mystery surrounding Keeley, similar to the mysterious disappearance of Tesla's work. Am I assuming foul play? Not necessarily, but it's not off the table when certain industries are invested. We all know that. Dale went on to explore and explain the nature of sympathetic vibratory physics in which Keeley was working on. The foundation of Terrence Howard's theories are primarily built upon this. I'm not going to go too deep on Rupert Sheldrake here, but he is still alive and kicking. He's most known for his theories he calls morphic resonance. The theory proposes that cells tap into a morphic field of information to, to perform operations they do within the body for all organisms, like an internet for life. Very interesting stuff, all related. Let's look into what all of this stuff means. But before we dive into that, what do all of these guys have in common? Tesla, Keeley, Russell, and Sheldrake have all been ridiculed by established industries and entrenched ways of thinking. That is red flag number one for me when I dive into this stuff. And I assume that most people will be turned away, but I go deeper into that stuff because I think that while there may be some weird stuff in there, there may be some nuggets of truth that I can combine into some form of working theory. And that is all I try and do. So let's go deep into what they're talking about let's start with the periodic wave of elements so we have the difficult table of elements and we have the easy table of elements if you watched the rogan episode with terrence howard we're going to talk about this periodic wave of elements pioneered by walter russell now he claims every element is just resonating at different frequency and our senses perceive that element in specific ways this makes sense why because everything from gravity infrasonic or seismic radio acoustic ultrasonic microwave infrared visible ultraviolet x-ray gamma it's all a spectrum the whole thing is a spectrum of energy that's what everyone means when you hear the cliche everything is vibration whatever it goes all the way down to the quantum scale all the way up to the galactic scale it's just a spectrum of specific wavelengths at different scales. Our senses are just tuned to the ones we can perceive to give us a human experience. The fact that this is still debated to me is kind of weird, but whatever, let's keep going. Periodic wave of elements shows how just like in the visible or acoustic spectrum, the frequency determines the tone of the wave. In music, this would be the tonal quality that you hear. In the visible spectrum, it would be the tone of color, like a skin tone. The central column here is the noble gases. They're noble because they have full electron shells, making them extremely stable and not very likely to participate in chemical reactions. Like welders, oxyacetylene welders use this as a shielding gas so that it can that welders can focus the actual combustible gas. That's when you adjust the nozzle on those welding tips so you can adjust the, the flame. Charging and discharging systems deal with electrons just like the battery in your phone does. A fundamental piece of this puzzle, like electrons act like a particle and a wave. This has been a conundrum in quantum science for decades and decades and decades now. In a confined space like a galaxy or a solar system or even a petri dish of water, things that resonate together love being together, just like music festivals. Pressure conditions in this sense means how close things are to each other. Compressing a gas doesn't make it a new element, but when pressure is great enough to pull things apart, we have fission. When it's great enough to, to fuse them together, it is fusion. The pressure is directly related to density, and we'll cover that in a bit. So I'm going to bring this, I'm going to bring this table up because... I need to explain some things on the table too. This will be an exclusively YouTube piece of content here. In the Rogan podcast, they did not go in depth with this periodic wave table of elements. And I'd like to explore that a little bit because this is Walter Russell's work. Originally, he 
this is a recreation of it walter russell in russell's drawing he he sections off the elements in octaves of matter and the new one does as well but russell's is just kind of obviously it's 100 years old we have a little more knowledge on this and dale pond expanded on it so the new one is just dale pond and walter russell's explanation of this periodic table in one periodic table so i'm gonna go back to that one and show you that so what you have here is the elements in heaviest at the bottom into the lightest at the top starting with alpha non and then ending with omega non alpha and omega you get it so when we look at it this central column here is the noble gases meaning they're not they're they have inertia they don't react with chemicals they, they do but it's very rare they're very stable they're in the center on the poles you have matter swinging from left to right in a periodic function periodic manner the red number is the atomic number that you would see normally on the periodic table the blue number is the number of electron shells so when you look at this how the elements are arranged is technically the same way as the old periodic table but this periodic table just makes it a little easier to understand in terms of energy how these elements are organized so heavier elements obviously are down here where you have like you have your very 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 reactive uh like plutonium uranium all of these things were used in nuclear bombs these are the, the first nuclear bombs hydrogen is also crazy explosive that is why it's on this part right here right in between the the like dead center of these like right at the fourth octave between the third octave any of these octaves are going to be at poles of the wave so that doesn't necessarily mean that they're explosive it just means that they have interesting properties because they are very reactive carbon we're carbon based life forms it's very it's it builds stuff silicon we use silicon in computer chips it's a it's silicate it's a it's a crystal it's it's used for it has a whole bunch of uses you'll see that most of these on the on the poles have an, have a very wide array of uses and in industry medicine all of the you know everything that we do and the ones when he goes charging systems and discharging systems you'll notice that the stuff that we use in batteries like lithium is a charging system very easy to understand charging systems want electrons discharging systems want to get rid of electrons so it's it's the same thing we're not changing physics here we're just changing the way that physics that matter is looked at we're changing the way that we understand it and in, in the in the sense of where science is going versus where it was before where it was before is we break down all the elements we break down everything that we know about the natural world and we categorize it and we study its properties so that we know it better which is very useful but we need to know how they all relate to each other and this periodic table shows that a lot better than the old periodic table old periodic table is more compartmentalized this periodic table shows how matter relates to other matter in terms of what it's actually made of a it's all vibrations so if you change frequencies and pressure conditions like what terence was saying you can manipulate matter you can do things with matter you can literally you can do everything that we're doing now but it makes more sense that's all this was in the rogan podcast terence briefly touches on the platonic solids now the platonic solids in the way that i explain them have always been an approximation i agree with terence there are no straight lines even though you may be able to draw a seemingly straight line at the atomic level it can't be and if you even zoom in on your straight line you'll see that it's actually pretty curved now i cover the flower of life in codex geometrics and in but i will explain it once more from this shape we can create all shapes and pretty much all information we need to know about the universe just using circles from it we get metatron's cube which comes with all of the platonic solids now terence uses the flower of life when he's explaining the tetrians and it's 
Tetrian, not Tetrion, Tetrian. When he explains the Tetrians, the Tetrians are those curved triangle things that he was trying to, he was explaining to Joe. Now, the Tetrian is a form of the Tetrahedron. The Tetrahedron is the platonic solid of the Tetrian, which I cover extensively in Geometrics. It is, it is how, it is very useful. We'll just say that. I'll go into that later. But where we get this is not one specific tradition because it's been used throughout the ancient world up until today. Terence mentions this in this clip. And there's other traditions and, and tribes around the world where their stories go back 200,000 years. Mm. And they made a lot more sense. So how have we limited ourselves? In the Rogan podcast, Terence goes on to talk about how ancient the symbol of the flower of life is and why that's a reason why people think they were more advanced than we give them credit for. For example, the Assyrians use this shape frequently, one of the very first civilizations that we have record of, like in this threshold that actually appears to be an interference pattern like we see in water and even on the quantum scale. An interference pattern is how waves interact with each other. And I made an entire video about this, I'll put it there. It's also found at the megalithic Osirian in Egypt. The food dogs that guard the Forbidden City in China have this pattern on a ball under their paw. It's carved into the Hopi temple, part of the Hindu Vedic Indus tradition. And this mosaic found in Ephesus of ancient Rome. During the Renaissance, da Vinci also drew this symbol in his notes and it can be found in cathedrals as well. So it is very widespread, very well known. Why do we care? So to approximate the platonic solids, we need to create straight lines between the curved lines of the circles in the flower of life. It's easy to understand, but not completely accurate. Now, Terence's shape is a more accurate representation of the tetrahedron and how it actually operates in reality. The tetrahedron is the shape of energy in almost every spiritual tradition. It is the simplest way to divide a sphere that can also contain a sphere called an insphere. We also use the tetrahedron to measure time. Here's how. If we tangled up a connect the dots picture, how would you go about untangling that? Those dots are the corners, the lines are the edges. Well, you'd have to start with a triangle. Any three points in here, if you make them an equilateral triangle, it does something pretty weird. Since they're all connected, those three points can show you where all the rest of the points are in relation to them. Now you can see that they are all connected, but we need to know how they're connected. We know where the group of points is because of the triangle. If we take a cluster of those corners and essentially pull it up, like picking a fishing net up off the ground, it'll show us how those points relate to each other. Now we can see that the fishing net is inside out. So if we take that and do that one more time, the net unfolds itself into the space. This is how we map things in 3D. You create a 2D projection of a 3D object. This technique is how maps are made and it's how your phone works. You map changes in terrain because you have depth or you can map an entire 3D object just by using triangles. When you overlay a 2D image, you have Google Maps. We saw how perspective works in the last video, but the real hero here is the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is a perfect division of the sphere just like all the other platonic solids. If we glue 30 tetrahedrons together on their faces, any measurement, they're all equal, they create something called a chiral chain. Unfolding that creates the helix. Now if we look at just the corners and the edges of this shape like we did with the puzzle, we get this. This is the shadow projection of that shape. Why does this matter? Those 30 corners are 12 degrees apart, 30 times 12, 360. Base 12 number system is the division of the natural world. Color, music, time, zodiac even. All the ancient cultures knew this. The Mayans are probably the best example. Their clock is essentially giant circles that keep track of this. Same with the Hindu and Buddhist wheel of time, same with the Greeks, especially the ancient Egyptians. You can't align a monument to a solstice or equinox without knowing this. So let's say you build your pyramid. At the equinox, you know where the sun is and you know where the moon is. This is how you align things to a star. Those three points can triangulate the fourth. This only works on a sphere. The Egyptians were well aware of this. The optics of a perfect sphere are the exact dimensions of the Great Pyramid. Even put the axial tilt of the earth and the raising of the jed pillar. The ancient language isn't hieroglyphics, it's geometry. Remember. Banger. It is the first 3D shape that exhibits scale invariance, meaning it can be scaled up or down infinitely and still retain its shape. It's also one of the most stable shapes 
in the entire universe. It dictates polarity, upwards being masculine, downwards meaning feminine. That doesn't mean that up is good or down is bad. It doesn't mean anything. It just indicates direction of polarity. Unifying them, we get the hexagram which is a universal key to harmony seen in the mixing of color and the mixing of music. The hexagon is also ubiquitous in nature, chemistry, architecture, structures, weather phenomenon, even on Saturn. So technically everything is a tetrahedron. And right now, a lot of research is indicating that the tiling of space time or how space and time is mapped is in the shape of a tetrahedron. This work is being pioneered by Dr. Nassim Harmin and he is with the resonant science foundation and you should definitely check his work out it's extremely interesting he's been doing this for a very long time and he's a very good communicator of his theories the way it is encoded is in the 64 tetrahedron grid which we can also get from the flower of life this grid was actually encoded by the hebrew tree of life or the sephiro and if you rotate 10 of them it creates the 64 tetrahedron grid in the rogan podcast with terrence he mentioned that the universe was constantly expanding and contracting like like it's breathing and that now is like it's it's very you can demonstrate this so if, if something expands i'm going to put this graphic up something expands and it hits a a boundary a creative boundary then that energy flows back into the system it's like it's a reflective thing so when it flows back into the system, it, it interacts with the energy expanding and it hits like a hot front and a cold front create a tornado and they create a vortex, which organizes, you know, the force, the energy, the particles, whatever is in there, it, it organizes that, that force, it organizes everything. You can see this in, in uh, like coffee grounds, if you have them in a cup or if you put them in water and you spin, spin the water, then when that vortex settles, all those coffee grounds settle into one area, right? That's This is literally the organization of matter within the universe is, is the inward outward flow of energy, creating these vortexes, creating galaxies, which then create suns, which then create solar systems, which then create planets and everything. That's why everything is spinning and everything has to be a sphere or a spheroid for this to actually work because that's the natural way that things interact. So I'm going to stop this one here. I'm going to make a part two because the next part, it goes super deep into like universal mechanics and stuff. And I want to make that it's an, an entire episode. I just want to touch on the key parts of the first part of the podcast. And then they get way deeper in the next part. So that one will come out very soon. I just got to finish editing it. If you want to keep up with me, please, please hit the subscribe button here because TikTok may be going away. I love long form. I know you love long form. I would love to interact more on YouTube and this will give me a clear sign that I should make more YouTube videos because I really want to. And if you are curious about this, the ways that I use to explain this stuff, I have two very good books on this. Codex will explain all of the esoteric side of things, ranging from sacred geometry to consciousness, even touches on psychedelics a little bit. Geometrix is the hyper-focused version of the sacred geometry section in Codex. That is why it is the second part in the series, because it goes down into the nuts and bolts of how things work geometrically in reality and i try and relate it to a lot of scientific concepts and explain it in a way that makes sense like the short form videos so if you are interested in that i will have a link in the description or you can go to baseforge.us and see all of the other stuff that i have out there i'm just trying to make things a little bit more understandable for you so that your life's easier and my life's easier and everyone's life's easier. I love you. I will see you in the next one.